Now for Ivan Milat, the backpacker murderer, the Australian serial killer who brutally took seven young lives. Miller is undoubtedly one of the most dangerous human beings to have walked this earth. He's an individual who kills without conscience, enjoys the thrill, and also was willing to kill large numbers of people without question. He's an individual that should never be let out of prison. Milat is one of Australia's most notorious serial killers. From 1989 to 2006, he journeyed across Australia, following tourist trails on an expedition of murder, targeting young backpackers as his victims. He's incredibly dangerous. What's also shocking in his case is the amount of torture and depravity he inflicted upon his victims, often in pairs, with often victims witnessing unspeakable tortures happening to their partners and friends very nearby. So not only was he a prolific serial murderer, but also a torturer as well. All seven bodies of the young backpackers were found in shallow graves or hidden under rocks in the Belanglo State Forest south of the city. Two of the victims were Australian, while the five others were foreign backpackers three Germans and two British girls who were the first to be found. Today, police revealed that four people have come forward in the past 24 hours who claim to have seen the girls in a country town close to the murder site. But detectives also concede that finding whoever's responsible for this hideous crime so long after it happened would not be easy. Superintendent Clive Small would be the man tasked with the seemingly impossible job of hunting down Australia's most depraved serial murderer. When I was given the job, um, my initial reaction was probably uh, there's a good chance this won't be solved. And the reasoning behind that was, you know, the fact they were backpackers, the isolation, the time lapse, the degradation of evidence at the crime scene. Milad's burial site in Belanglo State Forest was discovered by two runners who came across a decomposing corpse. I got a call at work uh, and it was asked by the then region commander to go down and uh, assess the situation uh, where these uh, skeletons had been recovered down in Belanglo State Forest. A day later, two police constables unearthed a second body a few metres from the first. I think what the crime scenes told me and what the advice of psychiatrists and other people we spoke to told me was that this was a killer who was particularly vicious, who was particularly cold and who was particularly calculating. We had a serial killer who we believed would continue to kill until he was caught. After the first body was discovered in the forest and the police were alerted, it became apparent quite quickly that there was a second body. And there were a number of missing tourists and backpackers who could possibly be the bodies that had been found in the forest. Initial news reports suggested they were the bodies of two missing British backpackers. Caroline Clark and Joanne Walters, who disappeared from a Sydney suburb five months earlier. The two missing Britons vanished from their rented room at Easter and stopped phoning home regularly. Their Australian bank accounts have not been touched since April, and Sydney police have now called in murder squad detectives to investigate their disappearance. Police quickly confirmed that the bodies were indeed those of Clark and Walters. Five months after the two young Britons disappeared in Sydney during a working holiday of Australia, forensic experts confirmed that one of the bodies found over the weekend is that of Joanne Walters. But they'll not be certain that the second is her friend Caroline Clark until dental records arrive from London tomorrow. The appalling fate they met, however, is beyond doubt. The um, apparent cause of death of Joanne Walters was a uh, penetrating wound to the chest consistent with them being stab wounds. The way that Millet killed his victims was incredibly violently. You're talking about 10 gunshots to the head, 35 stab wounds to other people. So different ways of killing, but always with an intent, which is to totally destroy the area of the body that he wishes to destroy. In the case of blowing somebody's head to pieces, for example. So potentially he was aware that people wouldn't be able to trace who those human beings were. So there was a calculation, but there was also a highly aggressive violence. There was a cloth around Joanne's mouth and neck area which suggested she may have been gagged. 
The second victim, also a young woman, suffered an equally horrifying end. The preliminary investigation of the other female body suggests that the cause of death there may well be gunshot wounds to the head. The violent nature of their deaths revealed there was an extremely dangerous killer on the loose. There were several things that were particularly chilling about the murders. It's quite clear that in a number of cases, at least if not all the cases, the victims did not die immediately, but were alive for a period of time. What the police would have been looking at was a highly dangerous individual who had the power, the ability, to abduct and control not just one, but two individuals. For the parents of Caroline Clark and Joanne Walters, the news of their daughter's encounter with evil was utterly devastating. These are evil-minded people. And like dogs with rabies, there's only one way they're going to be put down and destroyed, because the world hasn't got the resources to keep putting these people in jail. There's got to be some system whereby we destroy these people, put their evil genes anywhere else. Struggling to maintain her composure, Mrs. Waters fought back the tears as she condemned her daughter's killer. And so all I want to say is I, that these people who have done these to, the, to these girls, that they are just proper animals and they ought to be shot. Despite a fingertip search of the surrounding forest over the next five days, no further evidence was uncovered. Investigators had little hope of an early resolution to this horrendous crime. Just over a year later, a local man discovered a human skull and thigh bone in an isolated section of the forest. The only real help the police had in this investigation were the deposition sites and the bodies themselves that the bodies had not been concealed particularly well was quite telling. The level of post-mortem injury was very important to them, and also that on some occasions the victims had been decapitated and their skulls had been separated from the bodies was very useful to the police. This is someone that really no one would like to meet on a dark night in Australia. Police soon identified the corpses as those of Australians Deborah Everest and her boyfriend, James Gibson. The discovery of the last three bodies provided some more clues to try and link all of the victims together. The manner of these deaths was perverted beyond belief. Given that the male victim of the three was found with several bullet wounds to the head and the victims had been stabbed in excess of 40 times, suggests either one offender is engaging in a lot of post-mortem overkill, or perhaps there were multiple offenders and everyone was having a go. There were also signature aspects to all the murders. Each of the bodies had been deliberately posed face down with their hands behind their backs, covered by a pyramid frame of sticks and ferns. One of the things that's quite significant about Miller is the way that he disposed of his victims. So he would bury them, but the way that he would do it would involve things like hog tying the victims and also covering them in quite a ritualistic way, like in ferns, for example. Now this suggests that it wasn't just the capture and killing of his victims that was important. It was actually the whole process. It may be that Miller actually was thinking in terms of misdirection uh, in making these little constructions around a body. Um, perhaps he just wanted to entirely mislead the investigation process. From the available evidence, investigators started to develop a profile of the backpacker murderer. They were helped by a public appalled by the depraved details that were emerging. Police forces in murder investigations are able to utilise a number of tools in their toolbox to try and identify unknown subjects. CCTV footage is one, forensic evidence is another, and fingerprints and genetics can all be used. They also have other semi-scientific, less well-proved techniques that they can, they can use. One of which is, is what we commonly refer to as criminal profiling which is at best a semi-scientific or pseudo-scientific way 
of taking all of the evidence at crime scenes, abduction scenes and deposition sites to try and produce a psychological portrait of the killer. The team scoured their own internal police archive and computer files for vehicle records, gym memberships and gun licensing. The profile of the victims made the hunt even more complicated. What confounded a lot of the police inquiries was the nature of the victims. They were people who were holidaying, they were backpacking, they were people who were not in their normal environs, they were not using their credit cards. Therefore, they were less traceable than they would have been if they'd been on home turf. Milad was, in fact, already in the police system. He'd been imprisoned for the double rape of two girls 20 years previously but identifying him as the backpacker killer was a different matter. The police in the Millat case, their unsub, their unknown subject, was on file. They just didn't know which name of all the thousands of names they had on file it was. So they had to cross-reference and triangulate a lot of, of little bits of evidence to try and point to the right person. By a painstaking process of elimination, the vast list of potential killers was eventually whittled down to just 32 suspects. The name of the killer was on that list, and his name was Ivan Milat. The publicity surrounding the case, already labelled the Backpacker Murders, led to a break. A British witness, Paul Onions, who'd narrowly escaped Milat's clutches four years earlier, came forward. Some of the strongest evidence in the trial is going to come from the so far unnamed English hitchhiker who survived an attempt to rob and kill him four years ago. Onions flew to Australia to help with the investigation. Paul Onions' impact was vital in that ultimately he was able to travel to Australia and help provide a physical recognition, identify Milat in a lineup that Milat was the man who tried to rob and abduct him and kill him. Acquaintances also told police about Milat's obsession with weapons. Ivan Milat was undoubtedly a psychopath and he was very proficient. He had a macabre interest in weapons and it's essentially like having that God complex, a recognition that you are so powerful, so important that you will decide when and if somebody dies. Police now embark on a major operation. 300 officers search houses belonging to Milad's brothers. Simultaneously, 50 heavily armed officers raid Milad's house and surround the premises. When we decided to go in, there was a very high sense of uh, tension. We knew that uh, Ivan was certainly dangerous and there were reasons to believe that other members of the family were also dangerous. The police were successful in finally apprehending their man. Down on your face, quick! The distraught families of the victims travelled from Germany and Britain for the trial. I do know, I do know. In the charge sheet presented to the court today, the police say their tests have positively identified a rifle found at Milat's house with a weapon used to kill the Britons Joanne Walters and Caroline Clark. The evidence police found at Millet's house was overwhelmingly strong. They'd found a 22 calibre rifle, they'd found camping equipment. It was immediately very clear to the police that he was clearly involved in the abductions and the killings and robberies of the victims from the souvenirs and possessions he'd kept. Ivan Malat, the 49-year-old former truck driver, was arrested nine days ago. Charged at first with armed robbery, he's now been accused of Australia's worst serial killings. At the killer's house were items he'd kept as trophies from his vicious death spree. Most grisly of all, a headband identical to one found on the decapitated head of German victim Simone Schmidl. Milat definitely enjoyed having mementos of his victims. It's the ultimate power because you own something that nobody else has. That is the knowledge that you took that life. That is the knowledge that you are potentially the only person in the world who knows how they met their end and where they are now. Milat's trial, which opened in March 1996, was to last a gruelling 15 weeks. The man whose gruesome killings shocked Australia was starting a life sentence today. Until the end, Ivan Milat, known for his passion for guns, had protested his innocence. But the jury, reduced to 11 after a death threat against one, did not believe him. He was found guilty of all seven murders in the Belangolo Forest near Sydney. 
The trauma of the trial was now over for the families of the victims, though their own brush with evil would haunt them forever. What I would ask for now, for my wife and all our family, is a little privacy. Are you almost relieved now that the wait of all those kind of months of anxiousness are over? Yes, it is a relief, in a funny sort of way. Ivan Milad was convicted of the murders and is serving seven consecutive life sentences, as well as 18 years without parole. Sentencing Milad to seven life terms, the judge said he'd shown a callous indifference to suffering and a complete disregard of humanity, which was almost beyond belief. The most important part here is that we had a person in Ivan Milad who was a serial killer who would have gone on killing until he was caught or died. He's been caught, he'll spend the rest of his life in jail, he'll never see daylight again, and that's where he should be. Milad's killing career and warped world finally brought to a close.